Honored by the invitation to participate in this famous gathering in the land of Africa's greatest personality, Nelson Madiba Mandela. Now in his 25th year, the mining in Daba has certainly made its mark as the authoritative place for an exchange of ideas and experiences on mining in Africa. The theme you have chosen for your deliberations, championing Africa's sustainable economic growth, is certainly attractive enough to bring to Cape Town all of us who have the transformation of Africa at heart. Ladies and gentlemen, with our continent having been blessed with so many minerals, it is not surprising that mining has always played an important role in our lives. For centuries, our minerals have been the attraction for adventurers and fortune seekers. Many foreign thrones and crowns are adorned with the gems taken from our lands, not always through straightforward means. Our lands have been fought over and shared and divided along lines that show no rhyme or reason. The pursuit of gold and other minerals has reduced many of our forests to degraded lands, some of our rivers to polluted water bodies, and diamonds from our lands are now sometimes labeled blood diamonds. It is no wonder, therefore, that some describe these minerals as curses instead of the blessing and good fortune they should be. The truth, however, is that mining is a necessity and not just an indulgence to satisfy aesthetics or curiosity. Mining has been an un important undertaking throughout the history of mankind. Everyday life is dependent on the minerals extracted from underneath the earth. Today, most of the things that we use ranging from the smartphones we own to the coins we spend to the electricity we consume emanate from metals and minerals that have been mined. The mining industry in many of our countries plays a critical role in our economies, providing considerable job opportunities. After centuries of exploitation, Africa currently is still home to 30% of the world's mineral reserves, and an even higher proportion of deposits of gold, platinum, diamonds, bauxite, and manganese. The story of mining in Africa has not always been a happy one. The irony is not lost on many that our continent, so rich in the minerals that are sought after by the world, should remain inhabited by the poorest people on the globe. The irony is, lost, is not lost on many that many of the areas from which the riches are mined look like the most deprived places on earth. There is no question that African countries have not always done well in negotiations with the companies that have mined our minerals. We've been handicapped in the negotiation process with the big mining companies because of political instability bad reputation, and sometimes incompetent and or corrupt representatives who negotiate on our behalf. The world has changed a lot since the early mining contracts were drawn. Today, we are a more politically stable continent and more committed to the rule of law, and thus mining companies cannot and should not stick to the perception of the high risk politically unstable place to do business labor. Some labor practices that were tolerated 100, even 20 years ago, cannot and should not be tolerated today. The distinguished Venerable Festus Mohai, former president of the Republic of Botswana, speaking at a meeting of the Africa Development Bank 10 years ago in December 2008, noted that previously African countries 
how to entice investors by granting extensive incentives such as extensive tax and royalty exemptions. Consequently, many countries earn little from such contracts. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we have come of age and we should not have to give unusual tax and royalty incentives and mining companies should not expect to make extraordinary profits on our continent. We are realistic enough to know the companies that come to do business must make their profit. But we want to work with them under the normal conditions that pertain in other parts of the world. It bears repeating here what I have said elsewhere. Africa needs her own set of smart, tough lawyers, accountants and engineers to negotiate the business deal in a transparent and honest manner. We must strike deals that are fair to both sides and can reassure the long-suffering African people that they are no longer being unfairly treated. Reviewing mining contracts is important for more than earning greater revenue. Governments must also respond to pressures from civil society groups and communities to ensure that contracts and mining codes address environmental protection adequate compensation to affected communities, and the rehabilitation of land after mining operations have ceased. Minerals are a public resource, and the negotiations between companies and countries should be transparent, accessible, and easily understandable by citizens. And that means we should do it all in language that does not need to be interpreted by experts. Communities should be able to examine mining contracts, finding out how much revenue has been generated and how and on what it is being spent. Long and bitter experience means both sides, African governments and mining companies, have to work hard to gain the trust of the people. One cannot, ladies and gentlemen, discount the illuminating report produced by a high-level panel chaired by the highly respected former president of this country, His Excellency Thabo Mbeki, which says that Africa is losing annually more than 50 billion United States dollars through illicit financial outflows. The report of the high-level panel on illicit financial flows from Africa commissioned by the Joint African Union Commission and the and United Nations Economic Commission for Africa Conference of African Ministers for Finance, Planning and Economic Development, revealed in particular that between 2000 and 2008, 252 billion United States dollars, representing 56.2% of the illicit outflow of funds from the continent, was from the extractive industries, including mining. <coughs> Please excuse me. And yet we know that the extractive sector, particularly mining, can help rapidly to grow Africa's manufacturing sector and be the champion of economic growth on the continent. That, of course, will not happen if Africa remains the place to come and dig minerals that are exported in their raw condition to be processed outside. We cannot and should not continue to be merely exporters of raw materials to other countries. The value chain of mineral extraction has great potential for job creation and can form an essential basis for the transformation of economies around the continent. We recognize the transparency and regulation of invested capital in junior mining companies underpin investment appeal. Over the years, our mining sector has been financed by capital markets on foreign exchanges. They have leveraged access to early stage investments to create significant wealth for investors offshore. The fact of the matter is that local capital within most mining jurisdictions in Africa, face geopolitical constraints in the funding of early stage opportunities in their own countries. 
Canada, Australia, the Americas, and South Africa have spectacular examples of considerable wealth created amongst individuals and corporations as a result of significant discoveries in faraway lands that are financed by early seed capital raised on their local exchanges. Ghana, undoubtedly, is amongst the most matured and stable mining jurisdictions in Africa. And for the first time, my government is putting together a regulatory framework and fiscal incentives to enable local companies list early stage promising prospects on our local stock exchange, thereby taking full advantage of these incentives. This will allow local capital the benefits of the upside in project development enable it to contribute effectively to the process of rapid economic development and transformation. We are now all more sensitive to the needs of the environment and the dangers posed by the degradation caused by reckless mining practices. We in Ghana have a big problem with the particularly dark side of mining which has been leading to an alarming degradation of our lands and water bodies. We have a name for it in Ghana, Galamse, i.e. illegal mining. Time was when this was a relatively minor practice of individuals digging for gold in their communities. You could describe it almost as romantic as young people try their hands at it before moving on to their main professions. Now, it has become a large-scale and dangerous operation that has reduced our lands and water bodies to sad spectacles, mainly as a result of the introduction of sophisticated equipment and machinery into the field by foreign controls criminal syndicates. In Ghana, we moved to address this issue by initially placing a two-year ban on small-scale mining upon my assumption of office in January 2017, in order to fashion and implement policies on how to sanitize the sector and ensure that in future, small-scale mining would not damage our environment. We had to train some of the small-scale miners in responsible mining and find alternative livelihood resources for others who were engaged in illegal mining. Our efforts have begun to yield dividends. Some of the heavily polluted rivers are showing signs of being restored to health. And recently, there was a lot of excitement. Fish were seen again in one of the most famous rivers of our country, the Ancobra River, after many years of turpidity. We are determined to strengthen the regulatory framework for mining so that illegal mining, i.e. Ganamse, does not reappear. I know that we're not the only ones experiencing this phenomenon, and there are other countries on the continent where illegal mining activities are threatening to overwhelm local authorities. The extreme case is probably the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, where its many minerals are such magnets for adventurers from around the world that they instigate the instability in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, Earlier on, I made reference to the state of mining communities in our country. I believe it is a point that cannot and should not be simply mentioned in passing. Take, for example, the town of Obwasi in Ghana, the home of Anglo Gold Ashanti, where there's been official mining for more than a century. In times past, it was said to be the richest gold mine in the world and it has certainly made some people in the United Kingdom and the United States, and probably in South Africa too, very rich. So why does Obwasi not look like the place from where hundreds of millions of dollars have been made? It should be the most beautiful city in Ghana, or the world, if it hosts the richest gold mine, but it is far from it. After an absence of five years from the scene, because of the uncontrolled activities of illegal miners on its concession, the company is back again. I had the pleasure of reopening the mine two weeks ago on the 22nd of January under an agreement 
that balances more fairly the interests of the two sides, that is the government of Ghana and Anglo Gold Ashanti. As I said at the ceremony, it is my hope and expectation that this time round, under the new management of Anglo Gold Ashanti, the development of Obwase will reflect the wealth its soil produces. Why is the Kona region of Sierra Leone, where a local pastor digging around his garden can still find a 709 carat gem diamond not developed and prosperous? Why do towns from whose soils diamonds have been taken all these years not look like anything they produce riches? Why the mining com com communities generally in such poor conditions. The, st the stressed state of communities in which mining companies operate is nothing short of a disgrace, and we must work to change that situation. <laughs> Even though a few mining companies have over the years complemented the work of, Ghana, of government in these communities, I'm certain that a lot more can be done to transform the communities if government and the mining companies collaborate in an intelligent and sustainable manner. Ladies and gentlemen, the mining industry has what it takes to help them make the economic transformation we seek in Africa. Go to any mine and it is obvious you are innovators, you are persistent, and you have expertise. How else? Do you find the minerals you see from the bowels of the earth? You are hard workers, and it shows in what you do. In addition to the exploitation of the traditional minerals of gold, diamond, and manganese in Ghana, we have also taken the decision at long last to exploit our considerable bauxite and iron ore deposits. We've established the Ghana Integrated Aluminum Development Corporation a public corporation, to take charge of the development with appropriate investors of the full chain, the full value chain of our bauxite resources in order to establish an integrated aluminum industry in Ghana. We're also determined to build an integrated iron and steel industry out of our extensive iron ore and manganese deposits to serve the needs of our country and region. And to that end, Parliament in its current session will consider and hopefully approve the establishment of another public corporation, the Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Corporation, which will, with appropriate investors, take charge of this undertaking. Another modern mineral, lithium, which is being used in several applications, is present in commercial quantities in Ghana. Work is currently underway, again with the appropriate investment to exploit it for the economic development of our country. We hope to establish in all these new ventures an equitable balance between our needs and the needs of the investor community. It is time for the mineral sector to produce win-win situations for all st stakeholders. I do not need to tell you that there are undiscovered riches inside the bowels of the lands in Africa, but I want to remind you that there are riches on the, tops, on the top of the lands also in the form of a young, vibrant, and dynamic population who are anxious to work and who, with the requisite skills, represent an extremely positive factor in the rapid development of the continent. We want you to stay here for the long term, Respect the land that provides the riches and be part of the transformation. Africa has made the world rich with our minerals. Our gemstones adorn, adorn crowns and homes around the world. It is time to make Africa prosperous and enable her people to attain a dignified standard of living. Join us in this exciting project for sustainable economic growth. The people of Africa do not have to be poor for others to be rich. The state of modern technology has made it possible, probably for the first time in human history, to establish a global economy 
which can generate shared and mutually reinforcing prosperity for all the peoples of the world. The world can then look forward to the emergence of a new world civilization, which shorn of greed and cupidity has boundless prospects for human advancement, where the overwhelming majority of mankind can live in dignity and security and give birth to a new extraordinary golden age where the arts, culture, philosophy, science, and technology can flourish in an unprecedented scale. I thank you very much for your attention. President of the Republic of Ghana. And I invite him to address the assembly. Madam President, Secretary General, Your Excellencies, Ghana salutes the historical significance of your election to preside over the 73rd session of the General Assembly as the first female Latin American and congratulates you most heartily. Your election reinforces our common preoccupation that gender equality must be a central feature of the global agenda. Madam President, 13 days ago, we laid to rest in his home soil of Ghana, Kofi Annan, the seventh Secretary General of the United Nations, the first from Sub-Saharan Africa to occupy this exalted position. On behalf of the people and government of Ghana, I wish to extend our heartfelt gratitude the United Nations Secretariat, led by the Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, and the whole world community for the outpouring of grief and condolences that we received on the passing of Kofi Annan. We were deeply touched that so many world leaders and people took the trouble to come to Accra to bid him farewell. Kofi Annan's passionate and profound belief in the United Nations and his certainty that a better organized and stronger United Nations would make the world a better place is an ideal that should not be allowed to die. Today, we continue to be faced with the stark reality that resolutions, norms, and any number of votes in the Security Council and General Assembly mean nothing without the political will to enforce them. We are still to come to terms with what the role of our organization should be. Should it just be a club of nation states that exist to look out to their own interests? One of its constitution, by we the peoples, as declared in this founding document, does the theme we have chosen for this assembly have any relevance in real life? And do we want to make the United Nations relevant to all people? We want an organization that ensures shared responsibilities for peaceful, equitable, and sustainable societies? Or should it remain the place to pass resolutions that are ignored with impunity? Now, President, when some of the nations of the world gathered in San Francisco 73 years ago and signed the landmark document that created this organization, it was a very different world from what we have today. And I do not refer only to the difference in the numbers in the room on that occasion, nor the difference in the mode of travel that brought the leaders to that meeting and the jet planes that have brought all of us to New York this week. Nor do I refer to the tweets by which we communicate now and the elegant handwriting that they employed back in 1945. I refer to the theme we've drawn up for this General Assembly and wonder if it would have been comprehensible to that group in San Francisco. It is a different world we currently live in, and we should accept that this organization must change to suit contemporary needs. Madam President, 10 years ago as the General Assembly was starting its proceedings, the world was plunged into a financial crisis. The first scenes of that crisis were played out on the street not far from where we are gathered, 
but the consequences were felt and are still being felt around the world and in small countries like Ghana. Some say that upheaval lies at the heart of the change in politics and outlook around the world. Today, as we speak, a trade war is being stoked between the two largest economies of the world. The consequences will affect those who have had no say, including small countries like Ghana. These events provide proof, if some were needed, that ours is an interdependent world. We in Ghana, and other parts of the African continent are determined to pull our country out of poverty and into prosperity. We do not think that a nation needs to remain poor or become poor for others to become prosperous. We believe that there is room and there are enough resources on this planet for all of us to be prosperous. But it does mean that the rules and regulations that we fashion to guide our dealings with each other have to be respected by all of us. From the environment to trading rules, we have to accept that there cannot be different set of rules for different countries. Thus far, the United Nations provides the best vehicle for all nations to address their aspirations and challenges. Ghana has always displayed her belief in the United Nations and sought to contribute to her share in making the organization a successful one. We have embraced the SDGs and integrated the 17 ambitious goals into our national vision and budget. We contend that Ghana, we intend that Ghana will in July 2019 take a turn to present our voluntary national review during the ECOSOC High Level Political Forum. And we will share our successes and challenges as well as opportunities for new and continuing partnerships. Madam President, it is important to reiterate that advocating for a world order in which all countries sign up to obey the rules does not mean that we want uniformity. We take pride in what distinguishes us as, as Africans and as Ghanaians. 55% of the work of the Security Council last year had to do with Africa. Unfortunately, this invariably meant peacekeeping and poverty-related issues. We no longer want to be the place that requires peacekeepers and poverty-fighting NGOs, no matter how noble their objectives. Our regional bodies like ECOWAS and our continental body, the AU, are making systematic efforts, despite significant handicaps, to bring peace and stability to the entire continent. And sooner, rather than later, they will succeed. We know we must get our population educated and trained, and we are setting about it. We must address our infrastructural deficit. The traditional methods of tackling this problem will not provide the answer. We are looking for new ways to resolve it. Ghana, like many countries in Africa, is forging relations with China to make arrangements to help address part of our infrastructure deficit. This is not a uniquely Ghanaian or African phenomenon. It has not been lost on us that the developed, rich, and well-established countries have been paying regular visits to China and seeking to open new economic ties and improve upon existing ones. It is also not lost on us that a lot of anxiety is being expressed about the possibility of a recolonization of the African continent by a new power. We should indeed learn from history. It was at the turn of the 20th century that China's first railways were built by Western companies, financed by Western loans to a nearly bankrupt Qing dynasty. And it was under those circumstances that a strategic port called Hong Kong was leased for 99 years. And the rest, as the saying goes, is history. Today, the former victim of Western railways imperialism is lending billions to countries throughout Africa, Asia, and Europe to construct not only railroads, but also highways, ports, power plants, and other infrastructure, and many businesses. The historical echoes are certainly worrisome, but yes, surely, we must and can learn from history. 
We in Ghana must build roads, bridges, railways, ports, schools, hospitals, and we must create jobs to keep our young people engaged. It is obvious to us that the development trajectory we have been on for many decades is not working. We're trying a different one, and we would appreciate the support and goodwill of the world, especially in helping to stem the huge flow of illicit funds from the continent. It is in everybody's interest that we who are counted amongst the poor of the world make a rapid transformation from poverty to prosperity. We are determined in Ghana and increasingly in more and more parts of Africa to chart our own path to prosperity and pay our own way in the world. We are no longer interested in being a burden on others. We will shoulder our own responsibilities and build societies and nations that will be attractive to our youth. We have the necessary sense of enterprise, creativity, innovation, and hard work to engineer this transition. Hence our vision of a Ghana beyond aid, indeed, of an Africa beyond aid. Madam President, it is equally important that the United Nations is reformed to be able to preside over this changed and changing world to which we all aspire. The powerful nations must be willing to adapt to the changes to make our world a better place. After all, we all inhabit the same planet and we all owe the same duty of care to ensure its survival. The African Common Position on UN Reform, as expressed in the Ezzelwini Consensus, remains the most comprehensive proposal for reform of the United Nations, particularly of the Security Council. It is time the global community endorsed it to create a modern United Nations fit for purpose in our time. May God bless the United Nations and us all. I thank you for your attention. The President of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Aku Fadaru. Mr. President, along with me, Christophe Babouvier, interviewing you from RFI. Mr. President, hello. Hello. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to both of you. Mr. President, Mr. President, Today, worldwide, amongst those who've been vaccinated, only 2% are Africans who've been vaccinated. The South African president, the DG of the WHO, have talked about vaccine apartheid. Do you agree with them? Well, I don't think it's a matter of agreeing or not. I mean, we're talking about the facts here. How is it that the African continent doesn't have enough access to vaccines? Really, there is no other explanation. Is this a scandal? Yes, it is a scandal. But I must say that it is a scandal for which we are in part responsible. We were part of creating this situation. We are partly behind this scandal because we didn't create the necessary opportunities, the facilities, the capacity to manufacture our own vaccines. When I took office as president of Ghana some four years ago now, I spoke of the fact that the new policy in Ghana would be one where we would focus on Africa, one where we would seek to be much more, much more self-reliant. Yes, self-reliant. Exactly. Self-reliant. And that is why in Ghana we actually kicked off a whole program which has been going on for quite some time now to make our own vaccines. Obviously, we had the pandemic that we have been currently going through. Ten years ago, it was Ebola. Today, it's COVID. Who knows what it's going to be in the future? Really, we must have our own capacity to make vaccines. And I'm quite encouraged by what I'm doing in my country, South Africa, Senegal, Rwanda as well. They have already put in their own facilities to make their own vaccines. Yes, but what about now, Mr. President, while all that's being established? Are you asking Western countries for them to give you the surplus vaccine? 
vaccines they already have? Well, of course. For the time being. For the time being, we really have no other choice. We have the COVAX facility, which was set up, and it is something which is actually quite progressive and quite appreciated. And the COVAX is going to be a true mobilizer. It really will be a mobilizer, where we will be able to get access to surplus doses from the Western world. Now, you have an objective of inoculating 20 million Ghanaians by the end of the year. But if you've got 20 million doses, are you sure the Ghanaians will accept to be vaccinated? For instance, look at what's happening in Congo, Kinshasa. Many people are refusing to get vaccinated. They're afraid it's an international conspiracy to exterminate Africans, as President Shisekedi has said. What can you do to convince these people? I believe that we have already won over the Ghanaian people. Yes, in the past there was some skepticism, people had their reserves, in Ghana like elsewhere. But right at the outset, when Ghanaian leaders, not just political leaders, but also traditional leaders, religious leaders, people within the community who were opinion makers and opinion leaders, they all served as role models. I was in fact the first in Ghana to have a vaccine, then my wife. Straight after us, the vice president and his wife, they too got the vaccine. And that's how things panned out. Then the Asante king, a very important man in Ghana, he too took the vaccine. And he showed people that there was nothing to fear, that there was nothing wrong with the vaccine. And for the time being, the Ghanaian people have accepted the fact that vaccines are the way out. So far, we have vaccinated some one million people. And what I can see is that everywhere around the country, people are wanting to have access to the vaccine. So I really don't think that in Ghana, this story of a conspiracy has really gained any currency within our communities. 18 months ago in Abidjan, Presidents Ouattara and Macron announced the transition of the CFA franc into the ECHO. Now the ECHO, that's the name Western Africa, the, the ECOWAS, selected for its future single currency which means President Buhari of Nigeria is unhappy. He would have preferred to be consulted before the announcement in Abidjan. Does this mean that that day Ivory Coast in France committed a misstep? Maybe, but really we've moved on from there. Because we have ECOWAS with Presidents Ouattara, President Macky Sall. Also we have leaders from Francophone-speaking countries, the AMU countries as well, and all all of us, we share in the same concerns. Our concerns are that the current situation is no mere coincidence. It was created. Of all of the 15 countries of ECOWAS, we all agree on the way forward. We must reach an agreement. And that agreement must bring us not just a common market, but a common currency. When will it happen? For the time being, the current timeline is for five years. In recent years, jihadist terrorism has come ever closer to Ghana. We saw violence in southern Burkina Faso, in northeastern Ivory Coast, terrorist actions in those countries. My question. Has Ghana been under threat? Have you prevented terrorist attacks? Because this is just a few kilometers away. We are very concerned by the situation because we know full well that in Ghana, this is something that won't just stop at our borders. There are coastal countries, countries in Western Africa, and these countries are also targets of terrorism. They're just as much targets as the Sahel countries. We have targets. Were there attempts? There haven't yet been any attempts. But we are following the situation very closely. That is the main challenge for the time being for all of the 15 ECOWAS countries. We are very concerned about terrorism.
And for that, we kicked off the ACRA initiative. And through the ACRA initiative, we will seek to try and increase intelligence capabilities so that we can gather intel. And the reason is because we know full well that we are exactly as you said, targets, targets, exactly right. We are targets of what is happening in the Sahel. And it is so essential for us to focus on security. For me, that is the most important thing that we must focus on. We must focus on security to manage the situation. A month ago, President Idris Déby died on the battlefield. It really is a great tragedy. And yesterday, the African Union Peace Council approved the military transition in Chad. If it just lasts 18 months and leads to inclusive elections. But, Mr. President, in Africa, many people feel that in Chad, like in Mali for that matter, you, heads of state in Africa, are overly lenient uh, with military people who take power. And this leniency may encourage further military coups. I don't agree with that sentiment. Take ECOWAS, for example. ECOWAS decided that it was an absolute necessity to maintain political structures within countries that belong to ECOWAS. And ever since that decision was made, the era of military coups has been on the decline because we stated quite clearly that the only way for people to have access to power was through democratic means. Now, yes, there were the attacks in Mali which brought about the downfall of the president-elect, President Aboubakar. And those attacks, well, they, they were a rare case within ECOWAS countries, within our community. But that said, there have been other opportunities, other occasions in Chad and Mali where the reality on the ground requires of us to make certain accommodations where we have to make accommodations with the situation and with the military powers. And just as the African Union did, we did with the ECOWAS in relationship to Mali, we recognize that, yes, for the time being, for the stability of the country, for the sound governance of the country, to avoid the country falling into anarchy. And we recognize the powers and the authorities in place. But we also, at the same time, say that if these countries wish to stay within our community, within our continental organizations, our regional organizations, then they must be aware of the fact that we, in the mid and long term, won't continue relations with them if they aren't democratic countries. And these are limits that we have put down. Now, I don't think it's about being lenient. When we look at what has happened in Chad, what alternative do we have? In Mali, the transition officials won't be allowed to stand for elections. That, that is exactly it. It's part of the same thing. Should they do the same thing in Chad? Now, I don't know if we can say should because I don't have all of the right information at hand, but I think in principle, it's very much the same situation. We must really strive to insist on the fact that we will uphold the Charter of the African Union and of ECOWAS, because these are charters that maintain that democratic means are the only way to have power. As was the case in Mali, it is the case in Chad. And I really don't think that leniency is the right word to use. I don't think you can describe our action as such. Thank you, Mr. President, for this interview. Also, thank you to our listeners and our viewers. On the decision to accept this invitation was not a difficult one to make, as it was brought to my attention directly by my national security advisor, Brigadier General Retired Emmanuel Ochre, who is an alumnus of the center. 
So as you can see, I have very little choice in the matter. The fight to enhance security in Africa is a major priority of the contemporary global agenda, which we must collectively embrace. And I therefore heartily applaud the Africa Center for Strategic Studies for this vision and initiative. And congratulate also the security officers drawn from across the continent for being chosen for this important program. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is that peace, freedom, and prosperity walk in tandem. I might add that respect is often the unstated but constant companion of peace, freedom, and prosperity. And wherever these three go, respect always follows. When a country is peaceful, free, and prosperous, it is respected. If the African continent is to take its rightful place in the world, it has to shed its image of instability and overcome the wars that have plagued us for so long. Those who seek to play meaningful leadership roles in Africa would necessarily have to prioritize the establishment of a peaceful atmosphere on the continent. The people's of the African continent are vibrant, even loud people, and long may that continue. I'm talking about taking advantage of the dynamism and the youthful exuberance of the people to build the orderly and prosperous societies that promote peace. I'm talking about building the free societies that promote the spirit of competition, and at the same time, recognize that there will always be some that require the safety nets provided by humane and civilized societies. It will be a good idea to look briefly at some of the issues that cause instability in many African countries. If we are able to identify clearly what causes the unrest and wars on our continent, it would naturally be easier to find solutions. For us in Ghana, Political instability described much of the early decades of our life as an independent nation. And we became notorious for sampling every and any type of political experiment. The instability instigated the collapse of the economy and led to the exodus from the country of many citizens and professionals. We are probably not still recovered from the tendency to want to leave the country as the answer to difficult situations. I'm happy to state, though, that for the past 29 years of our Fourth Republic, we've enjoyed political stability under a multi-party constitution and the longest period of stable constitutional governance in our hitherto tumultuous history. The separation of powers is now a real phenomenon in Ghanaian life, promoting accountable governance. Efficient public services are now within reach. We have in this period experienced through the ballot box the transfer of power from one ruling political party to another on three occasions in conditions of peace and stability without threatening the foundations of the state. The Ghanaian people have manifested in this era their deep attachment to the principles of democratic accountability, respect for individual liberties, human rights, and the rule of law. It has also brought with it more or less systematic economic growth and boosted immensely our self-confidence. We have not got to this stage easily and without difficulties. If I were pressed, I would mention in particular the electoral process as the greatest source of potential instability. The trigger for many wars and disputes around the continent can be traced to dissatisfaction with the conduct of elections. We know that the electoral process remains for many African countries one of the weak links 
that pose security threats to our democracies and the stability of our governance. Fortunately for us in Ghana, the work of the Electoral Commission has systematically improved to the extent that the general elections of 2020, the eighth successive one in the period of Ghana's Fourth Republic, was one of the best organized elections, if not the best, in our history, which won universal acclaim. The Electoral Commission, even in the face of the pandemic, embarked on a very transparent voter registration exercise, which captured some 17 million persons on the electoral register, representing 94% of the potential electorate to the satisfaction of all the political actors. And thereafter, conducted polls which saw the Ghanaian people turning out in large numbers with the nation recording a 79% turnout, one of the highest in the democratic world. The high rates of adherence to COVID-19 protocols on the day ensure that the exercise passed off safely, just as was done in the aftermath of the 2012 elections. The results of the 2020 elections were finally settled in court and not on the streets. After the losing presidential candidate, the fourth president of the republic who had lost the 20 election, 2016 elections as an incumbent, expressed reservations, which were subsequently unanimously rejected by the Supreme Court as baseless. The quality of the Electoral Commission's work has contributed significantly to the maintenance of peace and stability in Ghana. We have also in recent times witnessed threats to peace on the continent in the form of unconstitutional changes in government. Indeed, according to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, 18 African leaders have either modified or eliminated constitutional term limits in the past two decades. In addition, another eight resisted efforts to institute term limits, bringing the number of countries lacking constitutional restraints on the tenure of executive power to 24. This represents almost half of the number of countries on the continent. These developments, together with a number of other factors, have unfortunately resulted in coup d'etats on the continent. As current chairperson of the ECOWAS Authority of Heads of State and Government, I have seen directly the devastating effects the coup d'etats and attempted coups have had on the region. There have been at least three such occurrences in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso, and an unsuccessful attempt in Guinea-Bissau. The reappearance of coups in Africa in all its forms and manifestations must be condemned by all since it seriously undermines our collective bid to, read, to rid the continent of the menace of instability and unconstitutional changes in government, as currently defined by the frameworks established in the Lume Declaration the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance, and other important regional and continental instruments. Unconstitutional regime changes retard a country's growth. But ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing quite as potentially toxic on the African continent as the problem of job creation. Some of the statistics are both frightening and full of promise. The World Bank tells us that in 40 African countries, over 50% of the population is under the age of 20. Indeed, the median age across the continent is stated to be 19.5 years. There is a lot of young people who would all be needing jobs. 
that is also a lot of young energy that can be mobilized to the development of the continent. However, widespread poverty and disillusionment amongst youth in Africa are not only providing fertile breeding grounds for these youth who want to cross the Sahara Desert on foot and the Mediterranean Sea in rickety boats in the hope of finding a better future outside the continent, but also for a new generation of terrorists. This is exceptionally worrying because surrogates of Al-Qaeda in the Sahel and Boko Haram militants operating around the Lake Chad Basin, the two most active terrorist groups in West Africa, prey on the unacceptable levels of poverty in these areas, in the recruitment and indoctrination of youth. Additionally, the growing numbers of breakaway terror groups, in addition to our natural vulnerabilities, notably the spread of ethno-linguist groups and the porous nature of our borders, call for regional and continental approaches to contain the growing threats of terrorists and extremist activities. As leaders in Africa, we must be seen to be creating opportunities and jobs for our youth. Firstly, through education. We have as a matter of great urgency to open opportunities of education for all our youth. We're told that 89 million young Africans of school-going age are not in school. That has to stop, and stop now. In Ghana, at great cost, we've instituted a system of free secondary education, which has brought in a total of 1.6 million students currently into senior high school the highest enrollment in our history. We believe that the cost of providing free secondary education will be cheaper than the cost of, an, of the alternative of an uneducated and unskilled workforce that has the capacity to retard our development. Secondly, with the majority of the continent's economies dependent on the production and export of raw materials. Who can blame our youth for wishing to leave in search of greener pastures elsewhere or becoming targets of recruitment by terrorists? We cannot continue traveling this worn path of limited success of being exporters of raw materials. We have to embark urgently on the structural transformation of our economies. The only way to ensuring prosperity for our populations in Africa is through value addition activities. In other words, through industrial development with modernized agricultures and transformed and diversified economies. We must rapidly leave behind the old economies, and embrace the technological and digital potential of the new modern economies, and thereby give opportunities, jobs, and hope to our young people to live dignified, productive lives. Thirdly, through good governance. It is important that we promote and develop on the continent a system and culture of accountable governance, free of corruption, whereby our people are governed in accordance with the rule of law, respect for individual liberties, human rights, and the principles of democratic accountability. Such a system includes building strong institutions of state, such as well-resourced parliaments and judiciary efficient law enforcement agencies, and, and effective security forces 
that see their responsibilities and allegiance to the wider public interest, not just to the conveniences of the government of the day. Now listen to these, and to help confront the security challenges facing Ghana, we have launched a national security strategy, which is serving as the pivot around which Ghana's national security revolves. The strategy has the potential to consolidate further Ghana's position as the most peaceful country in West Africa and Africa. It is strengthening state response to current and future threats while enhancing our prevention, protection, and response capabilities at national and regional levels. I'm certain that if we set our hearts and minds to this, and focus our energies on implementing successfully the strategy, we shall succeed in creating a more cohesive, inclusive, peaceful, progressive, prosperous, stable, and united Ghana. We need to have peace in Africa to deal with the debilitating problems of poverty. As they say, l'argent n'aime pas le bruit. Money does not like noise. And indeed, we would all agree that where there is chaos, where there's noise, where there's unrest, we are not likely to find money or the widespread prosperity that will enable the long-suffering masses of Africa to live lives of dignity. If we are going to build prosperous countries, we should have peace. And those who would lead Africa must cherish and seek peace. I believe strongly that despite her numerous challenges, Africa is on the cusp of building a great new civilization, which will unleash the considerable energies and huge potential of the African peoples so that we will make our own unique contribution to the growth of world civilization. God bless Mother Africa and make her great and strong. I thank you for your attention.